name is Michael. Uh, I finished my mess last year in mathematics. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, and I just, I took some time off after the summer. I did some research with my university and then uh, I was lucky to stumble across Codesmith and, uh, and this opportunity to work with Jared and Gerard. And uh, I'm going to be a student in the upcoming cohort. And uh, yeah, that's a quick summary of where I'm at right now. Awesome. Yes. And I'm Jared Lewis. I uh, taught for uh, Codesmith and software engineering, and I've been transitioning over the past half year to teach in the DSML research group. And yeah, Michael and I have been working on this research uh, over the past couple of months, and we're pretty excited to talk about it. So I think we're ready to get started. Awesome. All right, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. All right. Uh, not right now. Slideshow mode. And I think we're good to go. All right, awesome. Okay, anyways. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, the title of our presentation is uh, Political Segregation and COVID Vaccination Rates. Uh, and Jared and I will be discussing uh, the machine learning approaches we took to study the relationship between political segregation and COVID vaccination rates. There we go. And as a bit of an outline of our, our talk, we'll just give a bit of a background and context for the study. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the data set that we used and uh, an approach to how we attracted some uh, meaning from it, uh, the tools that we built out in Python, specifically double lasso, uh, Frank sensitivity analysis, and Auster sensitivity analysis. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, next steps in our research and the resources that we used. Uh, as a bit of background, uh, the work we did was largely based off of the paper that Gerard produced, which uh, studied the relationship between racial segregation and COVID-19 mortality in the United States. Uh, if anyone hasn't checked, that, checked it out, Gerard gave a great talk on uh, his research. Uh, we have it linked right here, but you can also find it on the Codesmith uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and the data set that he used uh, contained information from 2,174 counties in the United States, which is roughly 96% uh, of the population. Um, and it contained 50 county level factors, which uh, potentially had some relationship between uh, racial segregation at the county level and COVID-19 infection mortality rates. And Jared and I, uh, the bulk of our work was in sort of two phases. We wanted to replicate the work in Python since it was originally done in Stata. And then our hopes were to produce something new and original and possibly extend those results. Uh, so after we were able to generate uh, to reproduce Gerard's work, uh, we're thinking of avenues of how we can extend those results and keeping along those themes, themes of uh, of COVID and the pandemic. And we stumbled across some data uh, regarding vaccinations. And we saw that there was some evidence which suggested that there was uh, some, some gaps in vaccination rates amongst political parties. And in general, there is bodies of evidence which suggest that there's less overlap in uh, political views between Democrats and Republicans. And this has been widening over time. So this is sort of a realm that we, we explored further. Uh, and continuing with segregation, we looked at, you know, political segregation and on the right, we have a sort a, a voting map of uh, Houston for neighborhoods, uh, blue being Democratic, red being Republican. And uh, we noticed it's a little more clustered Democratic in the middle. The outskirts are a little more red, more Republican. Uh, so again, following along this theme of uh, segregation, we thought, okay, well, how does political segregation exist in, throughout the country? Uh, moreover, how does this affect uh, our public health outcomes uh, and for, in regarding COVID specifically, things like mask usage, social distancing, and uh, vaccine acceptance? Um, so let's continue. There we go. Uh, and our hypothesis uh, was pretty much that we, we believe that neighborhoods and uh, counties that had higher political segregation would have lower vaccination rates. Uh, this was mainly the uh, under the assumption that uh, our social circles mostly contain people who think similar to us. And given that it was a time of you know the pandemic where we were socially isolated, we weren't encountering people with di different political views than someone, for example, who was more skeptical of public health guidelines would maybe be less uh, likely to abide by them and so forth. Uh, so that's kind of the outline of uh, the research that uh, we did. And I'll pass it along to Jared now to discuss uh, the data and our analytical strategy. So I'll stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Yes. So 
let's take a quick look at the data set that we used and our high level analytical strategy. And then we'll get into the weeds of how we built the tools that we used for our analysis. So the data that we had included uh, 1,216 counties in the United States, which uh, makes up approximately 72% of the country's population. And uh, you might notice that this is less counties than was cited for Gerard's research. That is because in order to calculate political segregation, we wanted to have counties that had 20 or more voting precincts because we actually used precinct level voting data to calculate our uh, political segregation index. And also the voting data um, that was reported wasn't always valid for county level analysis for some counties. In fact, the entire state of California's um, voting data didn't work out for the analysis that we were trying to do. So um, any voting data that had discrepancies or um, didn't work for you know, having precincts and county level data, we didn't include our, in our analysis. Um, but in addition to voting data, we had 51 county level factors, uh, including racial segregation. So it's the same 50 that Gerard used for his research on racial segregation versus COVID outcomes. And um, all these are still potentially related to political segregation and COVID-19 vaccination rates. So they were grouped into eight categories, which are listed here, but I'm actually gonna go through them on the next slide, but, which shows a little bit more detail. So we have demographics, which includes things like age, You know, what's the percentage of people in the county younger than 25%, older than 25, age segregation, things like ethnicity, um, education, right, income, income segregation. Then we had uh, controls or potential controls related to density and public interaction. So like population density, you know, how many people are commuting, how many um, people live in buildings that have 50 plus units, you know, domestic airport traffic, international airport traffic, what does it look like for that county? Things like social capital, you know, how many civic organizations are there, religious organizations, sports and bowling centers. Um, then we have health risk factors, such as like how many people are diabetic. Um, we've got more here, health system capacity, you know, how many primary care physicians are there? You know, what, what's the number of hospital beds in the county? And we have air pollution, essential businesses, like, you know, how are there a lot of people working in construction? You know, this can make a big difference for vaccination rates especially, um, or it, it has the potential to, I should say, and political views. And uh, so, you know, we want to control for, or at least allow the potential to control for the percent voting Democrat in 2020, because, you know, we don't want our results to be clouded by, you know, how many people are actually Democrat. We want to look at political segregation, right? And we have other things here, um, Racial segregation snuck its way into the wrong category, but this would be under demographics. So now we've, you know, we have an idea of what data we're working with. Uh, let's look at our high-level analytical strategy before we break it down into the individual tools we built. So at the highest level, we're trying to use regression analysis to estimate the impact that political segregation has on a county's vaccination rates. All right. And there are a couple challenges with this. Number one is that there are confounding factors that can drive the correlation between segregation and, oh, that says COVID mortality, but it should say vaccination rates. So in other words, if we were to just do a uh, you know, naive regression with political segregation on vaccination rates without any controls, then things like you know percent Democrat or I don't know, ethnicity, like percent Hispanic or age, right? If these are also related to vaccination rates and also related to political segregation, they could get baked into our coefficient. We don't see the true relationship between political segregation and vaccination rates. So we want to add other variables to take the influence away from what we're seeing in this coefficient so that we see just the influence of political segregation or as pure as we can get it on vaccination rates. So we have these known confounding factors, like things that we can actually measure 
But another challenge is that some confounding factors are unobservable or unmeasurable. For example, you know, personal networks. We don't know for sure, you know, how how often an individual talks to people outside of their social group or how often they're spending time with their family and things like that. And, you know, what news they watch. It's hard to measure those kinds of things, like quality of medical care. But these could be factors that also influence this relationship. So we need to handle both observable confounding factors and unobservable confounding factors. And we do this in this analysis following Gerard's, Gerard's footsteps using double lasso to handle observable confounding factors and then using sensitivity analysis to see you know, what would these theoretical, hypothetical, unmeasurable confounding factors, uh, how would they affect our regression if they were to be included theoretically? So I'll go through how we implemented double lasso and then I'll give it back to Michael and he'll talk about uh, Frank's test and Oster's test that we use for sensitivity analysis. So looking at double lasso, um, we're gonna first ask the question or answer it, what is double lasso? Then we'll talk about how we implemented lasso regression in Python, which is a part of double lasso. And we'll look in um, <clears throat> high level at a couple smaller details of lasso regression, including uh, the plugin iterative penalty function, lambda selection, we'll talk about that in a moment. And also how we ended up using group lasso to handle our state fixed effects, which we'll also discuss what these mean in just a moment. So what is double lasso regression? It is a linear regression strategy to use to select features that are strongly correlated with two variables, right? If you can remember that diagram we just saw, we're interested in selecting features that are related both to vaccination rates and political segregation. So if we can um, select features that are strongly correlated with these two variables, this helps us to improve the interpretability of the model and to reduce the risk of bias and instability, right? If we just threw all 51 of our controls into the model, it could be hard to actually interpret the results because we have so many things taking influences and we want to see, we want a parsimonious model that has the least amount of variables possible so that we can simplify it to improve that interpretability. And we don't want to have, you know, too much multicollinearity inside of our model. For example, if I were to include both percent Democrat and percent Republican as two separate variables in our regression, then those two things are essentially measuring the same thing, but they're taking the influence of the coefficients into two separate variables. So we want just one, like percent Democrat is what we're using, so that we get a more pure representation of that influence. Uh, a note here is that Gerard's analysis was completed with Stata, which is a proprietary statistical software that we've learned is really amazing. Um, it is really amazing. And it has a simple double lasso interface. Uh, but in Python, there's no library that implements double lasso. So we built it out ourselves. So the first part of it is, of course, to build out lasso. So what is lasso regression? Um, <clears throat> luckily, I should I say built out, but there are libraries that implement lasso regression uh, in Python. And it's a linear regression technique that's used to select features that are co strongly correlated with one variable. So here is our optimization function. And if you look at the first term of the equation, it's just our simple OLS, our ordinary least squares regression, where we're just trying to minimize our mean square error, this term, by selecting the best beta coefficients. So, you know, under the hood, the libraries optimize and take care of this, but we're not gonna pay too much attention to that. What we wanna look at here is also that we have a second term in lasso regression. We call this the penalty term, and it's used to push some of our control coefficients down to zero so that the sum of our values of the regression coefficients is optimal, right? Some of our absolute values. Now you notice here, we have two factors in here. We have our penalty parameter, lambda, which is the same for all of our coefficients. And you have to choose a lambda that's the best for your model to select the appropriate amount of coefficients so that you have good coefficients that you, know, you can interpret for your regression, 
And then we also have a penalty loading kappa j, which is going to be different for each coefficient. So there are different options for estimating lambda. Um, in fact, lambda is more commonly seen in these equations uh, or for lasso, but our specific implementation uses kappa j. But for lambda, uh, you can have uh, cross-validation, adaptive lasso, plug-in estimators, or Bayes information criterion to select the best penalty. And uh, I'll say the larger your penalty term is, um, the less, or <laughs> I can't remember if it's less or more, but whenever you change your uh, penalty term, it is going to affect how many of your coefficients get um, chosen by the model. And we used a plugin estimator, um, which is based on advanced theoretical results. And it results in the most parsimonious model, which means you know you have the least variables, and that way you know it's an easier to interpret model, and it's great for statistical analysis. Where, for example, cross validation might be the best for, or better than plug-in estimator for making predictions in the future. So something to note here is that Stata defaults to a robust plug-in estimator to calculate the penalty factors, um, and it's just built in. It just happens by default whenever you run double lasso, but Python's um, scikit-learn and stats models, machine learning libraries, which we were using for lasso, we ended up on stats models, but neither of them have built-in plugin estimators. So we got to build out our own. So something to note here is that a lot of what we did, we were able to um, find guidance for through status documentation or research papers that are out there out there. So there's a great research paper to talk about plugin estimators. Um, but status documentation outlines the formulas involved, an example over here. And you don't need to worry too much about the math over here. There's just an example of some formulas that we included in our code to um, find our to estimate our lambda and kappa j's. And it even included an algorithm to help us, you know, find our estimates uh, for those values or parameters that you can't just calculate. Um, so here, for example, in order to complete this uh, algorithm, we had to run Lasso with an initial lambda. Um, actually, the initial lambda you calculate stays the same, but some initial kappa estimates, estimates, and then you run a post lasso regression of y on your selected covariates from that lasso regression. And you use the residuals from your post lasso regression to get new kappa estimates. And then you check if convergence tolerance has been met. Um, this convergence tolerance is, um, like I said, it's based on advanced theoretical results from a paper. And uh, you just keep on repeating this process until you end up converging and then you have your estimates. So once we built out our plugin estimator, we had a working lasso regression function that could replicate what Stata does. And then we were able to move on to double lasso. So what are the steps of double lasso? First off, you run lasso of political segregation on all of your 51 controls, and it will select uh, some of those controls as the most important for estimating political segregation. All right. Once you've done that, you then let run another lasso regression of the vaccination rates, in our case, the Y variable, on your 51 controls, which will also result in selected controls that um, <clears throat> are most important for vaccination rates. And then once you've run both of these regressions, you have selected controls from that fit your political segregation, select the controls that fit your vaccination rates. You can then take the union of these controls. So um, any of the controls that ended up in either of these two sets, you end up selecting to be your double lasso controls. So these are the controls that you end up using in your regression to um, get your coefficient for political segregation, and vac on, on vaccination rates. So here is a list of the controls that were selected by our double lasso procedure. Um, percent voting Democrat in 2020, we expected that one to be in there. Religious organizations, makes sense. Percent global warming happening. This is, you know, how many people 
um, in the county believe that global warming is happening. We have age, we have some ethnicity in here, income, right? Some health, you know, smokers, public percent tra public transit, that makes sense. Um, and uh, racial segregation was also included. So once we had our controls, we were able to run a regression. And uh, here we have results from three different regressions, but we'll first pay attention to this bottom one. This is the coefficient that we get whenever we run a regression of political segregation and vaccination rates, including all of our double lasso controls and some state fixed effects, which we'll actually talk about in just a moment. But let's keep on this for a second. And we see it's actually statistically significant because um, our standard error doesn't cross zero here. However, it's quite small. Uh, and the way to interpret this would be that in counties that are one standard deviation above the political segregation mean, the dose one vaccination rate is 2% higher than the mean vaccination rate. So there is a result here, it's just pretty small. And uh, I will note that this is particular to uh, vaccination rates data that's just for all of 2021, which was the first year that the vaccination was available. Um, now to talk about these other two values here, this one up here is just a reference point. And uh, this would be the coefficient for political segregation whenever you run just a naive regression, no controls, no state fixed effects of political segregation on vaccination rates. So we see nothing too interesting here. And um, then this one, fixed effects, is uh, talking about state fixed effects, which we're gonna get to in just a moment. And you see um, this regression is actually just a fixed effects, no, con no other controls, but this regression includes both state fixed effects and the controls from double lasso. So now that we've talked about that, let's talk about a couple more extra considerations for double lasso. One is that sometimes you might wanna force a variable into these selected controls. Uh, we didn't end up having to do that in our case, but we did have to make sure that all or none of a certain group of controls were selected. And this applies to us handling our state fixed effects, which ended up being a very interesting challenge. So fixed effects, what are they? They are a modeling technique that are used to control for unobserved variation in a data set. So uh, an example that we encountered is states, right? Different states implemented different COVID guidelines and policies, and you want to be able to control for that, even though you, it's really difficult to measure those different guidelines and policies. So you can include what state the county is in as a variable. However, states are categorical, so we represent them with indicator variables. And down here is an example of how you would do that. So here's a table where uh, these are our column names up here. Each row represents a different county in our data set. And this column right here would be the original state category. So you can see here we have Alabama. This, count, this county, this row is in Alabama. So it has a true for the Alabama indicator variable and a false for all of the other states. And there's another one down here, Alabama true, uh, Connecticut. We've got true in the Connecticut column. And so each row should have one true and um, false for all the other states. But whenever you do this in linear regression, you have to ask yourself, what will happen if my double lasso only selects some of my state fixed effects? Well, that would mess up this whole state variable. So we have to make sure that either all of our state indicator variables are included or none of them. And we ended up doing this with group lasso. So here is our previously shown lasso objective function, right? Where we have a beta term for each parameter in our model. But the group lasso objective function handles it a little bit differently, where we have groups of betas, groups of our coefficients. So this is not just one, but multiple. And you just take the L2 norm of it, and you go through and you have a separate uh, penalty loading factor for each group of beta terms. So we were able to put every single one of our variables into its own group 
except for the state indicator variables, which we put into one group, all of them together, so that they were either all chosen or all not chosen, which they actually ended up being chosen. So luckily we didn't have to force them into the model. So <clears throat> this is how we built out our double lasso to get our results. It was a very interesting challenge. Uh, but the challenge isn't over yet because we still need to handle those unobserved confounding variables. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Which I'm excited for Michael to talk about. But there's one more point I want to make. Okay. I just wanted to show you all how amazing Stata is for statistical analysis versus Python, but also to show you the fun we got to have building out these lower level implementations in Python. All right. So, don't worry too much about what this code means, but I just want you to see that this line right here takes care of double lasso in Stata, and it has state fixed effects, and it's going to group them together, and it has the plug and iterative penalty uh, estimator all built into this one line of code. And then on this next slide, you get to see this is our Python code just for our plugin estimator, and it's okay that you can't really see it because it's not important to be able to read this code, but this is this is just plugin estimator, which is just a part of our lasso regression. So it took quite a bit of more work, but we were able to understand what's going on under the hood much better than we would have uh, otherwise. So now I'll pass it back over to Michael and he will talk to us about sensitivity analysis. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen again. Okay, slideshow. All right, we're good to go. Okay, so in the next two sections, I'm going to talk a little bit about sensitivity analysis, the first being Frank's test and building that out in Python. And as a bit of an outline for the next few slides, going to give a little a bit of a high level overview of what Frank's test is, a bit of a look at the mathematics and some technical challenges we came across. Okay, uh, before we go into uh, the meat of what Frank test is. Just wanted to give a little introduction to sensitivity analysis in general. Uh, I found this quote online that I really liked. Uh, it says that sensitivity analysis is the process of recalculating outcomes under alternative assumptions to determine the impact of a variable. So to translate this into our context, uh, we have our Y variable, we have our X variable of interest, and then we run our double S. So when we get these uh, selected controls, which we represent here as our uh, as our Z vector. After we do that, we run our, uh, our linear regression and we study that beta one coefficient because that is the relationship of interest between Y and our X variable of interest. Uh, but the question is, what if there is some other variable uh, that exists somewhere, whether we have data for it or not, and when we include it into this linear regression, how does it impact our variable beta one? Uh, does it nullify the result? Does it increase it? Does it decrease it? And uh, that's pretty much what we want to test. We do want to see how sensitive our beta one coefficient is to some external information. Uh, this chart here kind of gives a bit of an outline, but what Frank's test does is it says if we were to include a confounding variable into the model, it gives a requirement that would have to be satisfied in order for that uh, beta one coefficient to no longer be statistically significant and specifically frames this in terms of the partial correlations that the confounding variable uh, would have to have with the independent variable and the dependent variable y. Uh, just going to give a little bit of a look at the mathematics. I know this formula looks a little crazy or maybe a little daunting, but it's nothing to get too hung up on. Uh, just to give some information of, on things that we had to look into and also how it was implemented in Python. So uh, our, our squared values where we see subscripts, subscripts of X or Y with a, with a dot in, a, in our Z variable are just our multivariate R squared values uh, when we run regressions. So R squared underscore X dot Z is just going to be... Uh, our R squared value from regressing, uh, from doing an, a regression with X controlling for Z. And then similarly, if we do R squared Y underscore Z, that's our multivariate R squared variable. When we look at the Y variable for controlling for Z variables, um, those are easily accessible from stats models. Uh, and then we have our partial, partial correlation co coefficient at the end of the formula. And then we look at values like T statistics, uh, number of covariates, number of selected controls and so on. Uh, and this K value is going to be very important in the next slide when we actually implement Frank's test. Uh, okay, so looking at the previous formula, we compute our K value and the question is, okay, what, well, what do we do with that now? Uh, so we use that K value to pr produce the curves that we see on the, 
on the graph to the right. So you let your y axis be your partial correlation that y has with this confounding variable controlling for your selected control z. And uh, you, you let k being just be that you're constant. And then in the denominator, x is your x variable, which is uh, your partial correlation coefficient with x and your confounding variable controlling for these, uh, these z-selected controls. And we could just think of this as the function f of x equals k over x. And basically, all the points along these curves are values that would make our x the coefficient of our x variable of interest be statistically insignificant. Uh, so what do we do? We take the uh, observable variable, confounding variables that we know of, and we plot a scatter plot of all these uh, partial correlation coefficients, and we see whether they fall on the line or above it, and to, to just see whether they would invalidate our results. Uh, so we plotted it for all the fifty, the the fifty one um, covariates that we were looking at. Uh, we see that none of them fall along the line. Uh, the closest we get is the percentage of Democratic voters in the county, and actually racial segregation using this uh, the Thiel uh, the Thiel index. Um, the question is, does there exist some variable that you know it's, it's unknown that we don't have data for that could invalidate the results? And basically, the known data is to sort of give us a benchmark of you would have to have a partial co correlation uh, value pair, which is greater than something like population Democrat in the county. Um, and that can give us an idea of how strong or robust our results are. Uh, uh, some technical challenges that we came across. Uh, cal calculating correlation values can be tricky. Um, we have to, you have to look at your data and see which, uh, measures of correlation to implement. And once you figure that out, uh, there may be different methods for computing the same correlation value, uh, for our research, uh, the coefficient of multiple correlation is just our square root of, uh, the R squared value that you produce from your linear regression. Uh, but partial correlations can, co coefficients can be a little tricky. Uh, so we had a few attempts at this, uh, we tried doing Pearson's R applied to residuals. So basically you take, uh, you do two regressions, you take your X variable of interest and you regress it with your Z, Z variables. And then you take your Y variable and regress it with your Z variables. And then you, uh, you compute the, the correlation uh, coefficient between the residuals of both those models. Uh, we implemented that, that in Python and it just didn't exactly work out for us. Uh, it wasn't uh, mass matching our results when we in our replication originally. Uh, then we look at some state of documentation, uh, and then this use another method, which looks at t-statistics. Uh, that didn't work. Um, and our solution was the penguin package in Python. Uh, this logo in the corner isn't to be cute, but it is uh, the actual logo for uh, penguin package. And uh, this uh, implements a generalization of the variance of the residual method that I outlined in the previous slide. Um, uh, and that method is less computationally expensive than the residual method, and uh, the details can be found in this link. Uh, so the next um, sensitivity analysis test that we did was Oster's test. Again, following the outline of uh, the previous slides, going to look at what it is, a uh, quick look at the math, and some of the technical challenges as well that we may have come across. Uh, so this may look a little bit different than how we denoted things in the other slides. Uh, I just wanted to keep it consistent with uh, Emily Oster's paper. Uh, but basically, this is another look at an omitted variable bias. Uh, again, we have our y variable and we have our x variable of interest. We're just going to denote beta 1 as uh, beta as our coefficient. Uh, w1 is going to encode our selected controls uh, that are observable. And then w2 is going to represent some unknown variable out there that we may not, that we don't have data for. And we're going to have an R squared value for that, uh, this, this uh, regression model to be R max. Uh, and the question is, can we really infer anything about beta and in general, uh, the, this unknown variable, how it impacts the model, given just what we know about W1 and X. Uh, so the paper follows this pr proportionality ass assumption. So looking at the, from this model specifically, this proportion of uh, variance, covariance values from our known variables we say that that is uh, delta times proportional. Uh, that is proportional to the um, variance covariance proportion of uh, these W two variables uh, that we do not know about. Uh, 
So basically delta one implies that uh, the observed and unobserved variables are equally important in explaining X. Basically that would mean sigma one one over sigma one X is equal to sigma two two over sigma two X. So they basically play an equal role in explaining beta. If delta is less than one, then that would mean that the observables are more important. Basically the selected controls from the double lasso and delta greater than one would mean that these unobservable variables are, or play a larger role in explaining um, the, uh, this relationship. Uh, thankfully, Emily Alster in her paper, she comes up with a closed form solution for delta. Um, so we consider the two following regressions. We look at the regression with y and our variable of interest alone, and then our variable y with, the, uh, with our uh, variable of interest x and these known uh, observ observable variables. And she comes up with part, uh, a pair of values r, max, and delta, which would cause beta be, to be equal to zero. So basically, you run these two regressions, you get these beta, these uh, new beta coefficients, you get their R-squared values, and uh, for a given list of R-max values that you specify in this function, uh, that would uh, give you some value delta, which we looked at before, is this proportionality argument, but would also mean that beta would be equal to zero. So to give you a bit of an example, uh, when we ran our regression uh, our, after double last, so when we had our selected controls, we got an R squared value of 0 0.68. Uh, so we plugged in all the values greater than 0 0.68 up until one into this Delta formula. Uh, and we, we plotted it. And remember what we said before that we, this sort of baseline is whether Delta is equal to one. If Delta is equal to one, then they both play an importance. So we want Delta to be greater than one because that would mean that our selected controls are more important in explaining X. Um, um what else am i going to say here yeah we see that delta never goes less than one uh but the interpretability of this is uh if we were to add some unknown variable w2 into into the model and let's say uh it it would have to increase our uh it would have to increase our value uh our r squared from 0 0.68 to 0 0.8 and be about four times more predictable of our uh, variable X if it were to uh, make that beta coefficient go to, go to zero. Uh, so this is another look at what the state implementation. Uh, luckily, the, uh, thankfully, the author produced a library called PSA Calc. Uh, you have to specify your, your range of R values, uh, but it pretty much comes down to this line of code right here that I have boxed in red. Uh, but there's a good, when we tried implementing in Python, we realized we came across some difficulties. Uh, and then we realized it's good to probably check the source code when you're in doubt. So this is actually some of the source code for PSA calc. And we noticed that some of the variables are actually different from this Delta formula. So this is actually the more updated version from a paper that we didn't have access to. So this, that's why it was good to check the source code. And then implementing this just becomes uh, an exercise in mathematical programming. And it's fairly easy to get these values. You just use stats models and pandas to get your regression terms and variance terms. Uh, so the next steps in our research are just running separate analyses on majority Republican counties and majority Democrat counties, uh, looking at different time ranges for vaccination rates. Uh, for example, how does vaccination rate change every three months? How does that impact our beta coefficient? Uh, and possibly obtain more precise voting, uh, voting data for our analysis. And just uh, to cap it off, you know, some key takeaways. Uh, we learned a lot in this research process, looking at documentation, looking at source code, looking at re related research papers. Uh, we built a lot of good habits doing that. And uh, these are some good things to, to be conscious of. And then we just have some resources, resources available if anyone is interested to look into these uh, subjects further. Yes, thank you all very much. Yes. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> you. All right. I see some questions in the chat. So a couple of questions we have, though. Um, could someone explain uh, maybe the the kappa the kappa parameter uh, in in the lasso regression with more detail? In terms um, of what role it plays in sort of like the the model fitting process. Yes. Yes. All right. uh, 
you want Michael, to stop sharing? Friend. You want me to scroll back up to it? I can just. Uh, yeah, just scroll up to that. That will work great. I'm going to get there on my screen as well. Is, is this okay? Can I just end the slide or? Uh, that'll work. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the Kappa J um, <clears throat> in that, that term. So in general, um, this is, so this is from status docs. Okay. They, this Kappa is included as a part of the advanced theoretical results that I was talking about, but there was a paper, and this is about as deep as status docs gets with talking about it because the paper is pretty deep, but mm -hmm. plugin estimators use the structure of the model and advanced theoretical results to find the smallest lambda that dominates the noise given estimates of the penalty loadings. And so these penalty loadings, they're built off of, um, uh, Let's see, I need the other formula. I think I have it right here, right? Uh, yes, yeah. So they're based off of the residuals of the um, uh, lasso regressions or residuals of the regression after running lasso to get some covariates that are correlated with your uh, Y variable. And so the Kappas are just a more fine-tuned way based off of the standard errors to um, choose which coefficients are going to be included in the model. And uh, I'm also going to open up to Gerard if he wants to give a better explanation of that. But that's that's my best explanation. Uh, one thing I did want to mention really quick, uh, the whole shrinking of variables really comes from the fact that this last term is is bounded. Uh, these are these are bounded term by some real number. That, uh, that the, the code specifies, yeah. Yes, yes. And I don't think I said it um, during the presentation, but you are trying to minimize that term by selecting the best betas, right? So in the optimization, you are under the hood, it's optimizing, trying to select the best betas to minimize that term. So the Kappa just have a more fine-tuned way of looking at individual coefficients. Does that answer your question, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it hopefully helps uh, the person who, who asked it as well. Uh, next question we have here. Uh, what variables did you end up omitting from the final model after double lasso? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. We had 14 total variables that were selected um, and also the state fixed effects. And so we had 51 original variables. So I'm not going to list through all of them. Yeah, maybe not the entire group, but just uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah, were there any notable ones, you know, that were uh, that ended up not being all that relevant? Yeah, let's see. I'll have to pull up my list next to one another. But for example, like percent of people that are physically inactive, that was not chosen um, as one of the variables. And uh, let's see. Were there any education ones that were chosen? Um, percent college or more was chosen as a variable, but percent of people that graduated high school, that was not chosen. Um, <clears throat> things like, you know, percent in poverty, I don't think, yeah, percent poverty was not chosen, percent insured was not chosen. Um, uh, domestic airport travel, international airport travel. I was a little bit surprised that those were not chosen, um, considering I would expect that counties that had more like international air travel, more people would be getting vaccinated, but neither of those were cho uh, chosen. And if there were any in particular that were that you were curious about, I can let you know. But those are some examples of ones that were not chosen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Simply just because I mean, it's it's kind of interesting to see which ones end up being relevant, which ones aren't, you know. And so, um, great, 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 great. Uh, same thing. If anybody else uh, has questions, feel free to send them to uh, Laura or I. Um, and or if you have any, feel free to chime in. Yeah, I received some questions and I sent them to Jared so you can read them off. You can also use the raise hand feature and unmute if you have a question um, when you're called on. I think we have a nice group this time. I don't think we have any issues. 
Uh, yes, so I see a question from uh, Zurab. Were you able to use the model to deliver any practical benefits, for example, like influencing policymakers based on the results? So for our political segregation uh, research, we have not written our paper or published yet. Um, Gerard had very similar research that we based off of with racial segregation to COVID outcomes. Um, were, do you know if anybody used it? I mean, it has a lot of citations. <laughs> You're not. Yeah. Yes, for, for for policy uh, reform or policy a public health uh, you know reform or some of some type. Um, I don't know. I mean, science filters into policy discussions and at a rate that's too slow uh, to my to my uh, preference. But uh, hopefully, uh, I mean. <laughs> Hopefully we will not have another pandemic, but if we have another one, uh, I hope that those results are uh, somewhat somewhat used. Yes. Yeah. Great, Great, thank you. Yeah. Great question. Uh, political segregation had like a modestly positive effect on total vaccination rates, if I remember the results correctly, right? So like a one standard deviation increase is a 2% increase at the county level. What of the other predictors uh, had the sort of the largest effects? Like if you were to kind of start to talk about what's, you know, what's sort of the most relevant factor, you know, for vaccination rates. It's not like something like education, right? It doesn't sound like, you know, it's not like international travel. So, so, what, so what was it? Yes. The one that I remember having the most, I can pull up. Uh, I, I can't screen share it, but I can find it. Ah, beautiful. The one that had the most effects was um, the percentage of Democrats in a county. Um, and that was, it had a, uh, let's see, it had, sorry, having to look pretty hard here. Um, point, yeah, it was about a 10%. Um, Effect like so one uh county that had one standard deviation higher uh of the percentage of democrats in it would have 10 percent more um vaccinations okay so. great, great. all right uh, so so that, that's that's to be expected but what 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 michael and and, and jared are showing is that net net of that um effect which makes sense right so places where there are more democrats who are more at least for this pandemic they were more prone to embrace the public health messaging and get vaccinated net of that composition of the of the of the counties the way democrats and republicans are distributed across space matters an, an extra two percentage point uh, uh for the vaccination rate so net net of that you know baseline level of Democrats versus Republicans, the way they distribute themselves in space has this added um, impact on, on vaccination rates. I think that that's uh, a very interesting result that uh, Michael and Jared uh, have shown here. Thank you for that insight, yeah. So we've got another question here. Does group nas lasso necessarily provide more restrictions in choosing variables than regular lasso? Not necessarily. Um, if you were to put every single variable inside of its own group, you would have the same results. Um, so it just allows you to group some variables together uh, so that they are all chosen or uh, not chosen as a unit. OK. Great. And then is the intuition behind this is that it would maybe be too noisy a process to try and disambiguate like the effects of all the individual states I'm like, or so that's that why they're, they're put into one single group? Um, the, it's not this, sorry. Can you clarify your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so you mentioned before that like, so group lasso doesn't necessarily uh, mean like you have more restrictive, you know, like coefficient values or more aggressive shrinkage on your, your beta values than regular mm -hmm. lasso. Right. So then is kind of the idea behind using group lasso is that either, uh, if, is there basically, is there an interpretability benefit 
uh, because that way you can sort of say like states do have an effect or they don't have an effect, or is it for, for some other reason? It allows you to group all the states together so you can make sure that your indicator variables, which are, it's necessary that they're all included. Like if you take some of them out, you, they're kind of invalid, right? Like you need all of this, those indicator variables to be included. So it allows you to include those in the lasso regression so that you can see if they are all um, selected. So it, the, the core purpose of it is so that you can include categorical variables or well, the core purpose of how we used it. So that you can include categorical variables in your lasso regression, but without group lasso, we're not aware of another way to do that at this point. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Super. Gerard, did you have something to add to that? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to add something to this. The way I think about the, the group lasso is that, so uh, Python doesn't know, uh, Python, Python only sees uh, rows and columns of numbers and doesn't know whether some variables have to go together. So the last point that Jared made, uh, so here we're thinking about counties, uh, but let's let's imagine that we're uh, analyzing a data set where the observations, the rows were, were individuals, right? So there are certain traits of individuals that are categorical, for example, uh, race and ethnicity. So a person could be, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, Hispanic, Asian, so on and so forth. So the way we we we, we classify a person's racial and ethnic identity is like through a series of categorical variables that we encode as you know having uh, like a series of dummy of dummy variables um, to be consistent with the way it's the way we measure certain attributes. We are telling Lasso if you are going to pick uh, one of those dummy variables that speak to the racial identity of a person, you have to pick all of them because racial identity is defined by these series of dummies you are one in this so you, you're one uh in the column that uh, uh it's non-hispanic white but you are zero in all others so you have to uh you have to include uh all these variables uh all these columns if at least one that speaks to that construct uh is uh, selected um i haven't seen any papers and i think it would be a nice nice um simulation to run uh whether you how, how inconsistent you get if you are not forcing those other uh categorical pieces uh of a of a, of a categorical variable into a, a, a lasso regression where at least one is being selected meaning what if you don't force the group lasso and you just go with the whichever columns or features the the lasso the lasso selects given that the interest in this particular case, in the double lasso, it's not on any of those columns. We don't care. We haven't given you an interpretation. Oh, Michael and, and, and Jared haven't given you any interpretation on the coefficients for those uh, variables selected by the lasso. We they are just focusing on the on the on the net effect of, of political segregation. Um, that's how I that's how I see about it. It's, uh, how, that's how I think about it. It's just to put some common sense or theoretical structure into the whole process when we know it has to exist. Thank you, Gerard. Yeah, thank you. So, all right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, definitely a round of applause for Jared and Michael.